time. Um, I'm hoping to be able to do a little five-part series uh, on various forms of legalism. Um, there's legalism surrounding justification. There's legalism surrounding sanctification. There is legalism uh, that surrounds culture. There is legalism that surrounds concepts of reward. And when I've said, if you've been with my channel for a long time, you know that um, my intention or commission or what I feel called to do here is to teach Christ as our righteousness, to deal with the area of legalism uh, in justification. Christ as our sanctification to deal with the uh, area of legalism related to sanctification, Christ as our reward um, and our hope of glory to deal with legalism surrounding the area of reward. Uh, the enemy has erected belief systems that are erroneous around each of these areas of the Christian life and I, I always say I triggered all the traps in Christianity. And uh, in each of these areas, you can fall into legalism and bind your conscience. Um, and one of the reasons why we have to deal with these things is because they, they affect our confidence before the Lord and our abiding in Him and our readiness for His coming. Uh, like John said, now little children abide in him so that when he appears, you may have confidence at his coming and not shrink back in shame. And we are to hold fast to that which, which we have and guard our crown. Let no one steal our crown and let no one carry us off as spoil and let no one um, defraud us of our prize and judge us unworthy of it. We are to hold on to what we were given. And that is the power for uh, justification and sanctification. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. On the one hand, by believing the gospel, we were justified. On the other hand, becoming fully assured in the faith is how we are sanctified, our, how we experience our sanctification. We are already sanctified. But there is an experience of sanctification, which is probably better called renewal or washing. And it's by the word, and it's through faith, and it's by the Spirit. And it has to do with becoming fully assured that what you received in the beginning the, through the gospel is really the power for the Christian life. And what you received is Christ himself. Christ becomes your life. So it's still a matter of faith. Justification is by faith. Sanctification is by faith. And it is a matter of seeing what Christ accomplished for you, believing in it, and then even getting to the point where you're so fully assured that you're rejoicing in it. And that rejoicing is your crown. And that crown is your confidence at his coming. Because you've been perfected in the love of God, his love has cast out fear, you're fully assured in the faith, and you're running boldly towards him, not shrinking back. Because a damaged conscience that comes through sin consciousness by the law uh, causes you to shrink back from God in a spirit of bondage and fear, which is likened to death. In, Rom in Romans 8, um, in contrast to the bold coming to God that is likened to life and peace in Romans 8, and the spirit of son in the spirit of sonship, which testifies that you are a son of God and an heir, and there's no condemnation, and who is he that will judge? God is the one who justified you. There's no accusation laid to your account. You are free to come forward boldly, there's no obstacle keeping you from the presence of God. And the presence of God is what the gospel brought you into. The gospel brought us to God by bringing the Spirit to us. 
didn't just qualify us for heaven. See, that's what many people believe. They believe that we are justified by faith, which means they're going to heaven when they die, or their salvation is eternal. But they don't quite see that justification qualified them to enjoy God as the Spirit, and that brought it brought them into Christ, who is made unto us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Redemption is the hope of glory. And how we approach God today in boldness is has a direct bearing on how we will approach him when he comes apparently so all the apostles admonished us to be in a certain kind of condition when he comes and we don't know when he's coming but we want to be found without spot we want to be found confident we want to be found fully assured in the faith we want to be found without offense filled with the roots of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory of God. And that comes from a life of the effectual acknowledgement of every good thing that's in you in Christ, that, which is called fellowship. Fellowship is just the acknowledgement and the rejoicing in what Christ has accomplished for me, what he's provided and then based on that, I boldly come to God knowing there's no obstacles. See, I don't let my sin and my foolishness and my flesh stand between me and my God. The blood is the answer. And I come forward by faith in the blood. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. That God takes no pleasure in those who shrink back, right? But the things that accompany salvation are for those who, by faith, with boldness, approach God's throne. We have access to the throne of grace. We don't call the blood an unclean thing. We realize that it is secured. Boldness before God and entrance into his presence, into the holiest of all. We have access to what no angel has ever had access to. And for us, it is a matter of coming forward and saying, Abba, Father, in the spirit of sonship. And the high priest has been established there for us. And he has offered his blood for us. And he has made his flesh a new and living way for us. And he says, come near with a heart of full assurance of faith, sprinkled from an evil conscience, and having your body washed with pure water. And that pure water is the water of the word, which renews us in the knowledge of what Christ has provided for us and causes us to participate in him, which is called fellowship, in a way of rejoicing. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that though I'm weak and I'm foolish and I am this and that, I don't have to go look for dead works or another sacrifice to make a way for me to come to God. I can come boldly and receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because I have a high priest who is my advocate, my propitiation, and he's my offering. And when I come near... I am sprinkled with his blood, which is in the eternal spirit. Uh, according to Hebrews 9, 14, he offered himself up through the eternal spirit. And so his blood can purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I have the access to approach the living God. And when I do, I'm sprinkled with the blood and washed by the word, which I'm renewed with in faith as I acknowledge what Christ has done and come near to God based on that. And that's what eating and drinking is all about. You know, we talk about eating and drinking and Christ is our bread. And he said, and he's also our uh, living water. And in John six, he told us that to eat and drink of his flesh and blood is to come to him and to believe on him. And specifically his words, which are spirit and life. And then in John 7, he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. As the scripture says, he who believes on me, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. There's water, the cleansing. How do we get the water? Well, we come forward. He says, if you come to me and drink, and how do we come to him? By believing. He who believes on me. So when we come in the full assurance of faith, we come forward boldly to the throne of grace we partake of the living water that's flowing out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
and we are washed. We don't have another way to be washed except to come near to God by faith, based on the accomplishment of Christ. There's no such thing as holiness apart from that washing. Holiness is not a matter of perfecting yourself in the flesh according to the works of the law. Holiness is not a matter of abstaining from this and partaking of that. Holiness is a matter of coming near to God. Because the altar was sprinkled with the blood, and whatever touched the altar was most holy. Holiness has to do with our union and our participation in our union with Christ. He is the Holy One. You know, he said to the Pharisees, what sanctifies? Is it the gift that sanctifies the altar or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Because they thought that it was the quality of the gift they offered that made it holy. But his point is, no, the blood sanctified the altar and whatever touched the altar is most holy because the altar is holy and he is our altar. And we're holy because of our union with him. Nothing else. He sanctified us in his own blood. And in Hebrews, there is a speaking of discipline. But the discipline is about the fact that many people were deviating from the blood of Jesus as their way into the Holy of Holies and were tempted to go back to the temple and go back to the sacrificial system with the priesthood and to offer again what Christ had already offered which would be to account the blood of Jesus an unclean thing. And James and those brothers were still meeting in the temple. There was a confusion in Jerusalem, which is why Galatians was written, which was why Acts was written, which was why Hebrews was written, to show that, no, we've come to Christ now. And Acts is shown to show the problems that happen if you don't. <laughs> uh, you're sowing to the religious flesh. If you try to maintain have sanctification by the works of the law and perfect yourself according to the flesh according to dead works no you need to come forward and the discipline in hebrews 13 or the 12 or 13 13 i think is talking about hey we have this cloud of witnesses that have all testified uh it must be 12 because it comes right out of the um hall of the the faith of the patriarchs what they believed they are a cloud of witnesses, okay, to say what you believed in is real. There's a whole line of testimony. This is the testimony of the word. Christ is the reality of all these things. Without him, you don't have holiness. He is your holiness, and you need to come forward boldly to him. And you're enduring all this contradiction of sinners. Remember him. He endured contradiction of sinners against himself, but you haven't striven to shedding of blood. They were being persecuted, by people who were saying they had apostatized from Moses by seeking to be uh, sanctified and justified in Christ. No, you need to go back and keep the law. You need to keep the temple system. All right. Remember, James made Paul take a vow, or tried to make him take a vow to show that he had not apostatized from Moses, but walked orderly keeping the law in Acts 21. That's what was going on. And it was a kind of pressure of persecution that was bloodless. Nobody was getting killed over it, but was an awful lot of pressure. You have not resisted under the shedding of blood, right? Jesus did. Uh, and these are the contradiction of sinners against himself and the contradiction of sinners against the way. See, the, those who are loyal to the law are the sinners that contradict the way. And persecute those who are the faith. And now the pe people who are being persecuted, their arms were starting to hang low. They were starting to get exhausted. They were starting to get worn out. And then he says in the midst of that, don't despise the Lord's discipline. What is the Lord's discipline? In this case, the context is the discipline is that you need to be encouraged to come forward boldly and don't stagger between two opinions and don't be tempted to fall back into law. If you do, you're going to bear forth thorns and thistles. He said in Hebrews 10 uh, and 6, I think, 6. So there's this admonition all the way through Hebrews that you have to make a bold decision to say Christ is my the reality of everything. He is my justification. He is my sanctification. I need to come forward boldly based on the acknowledgement of what he has done. Okay, He is my Melchizedek and he has the bread and wine behind the veil in the Holy of Holies, and that bread and wine is my life. And if I don't have it, I have no strength to overcome sin or do anything. 
Okay? So we need to come forward boldly, and God has no pleasure in those who shrink back. And to come forward boldly is to enter his rest. To be in faith is to cease from our own works and to serve the living God. You are not serving God if you're trying to perfect yourself according to the law and by dead works. Only the blood of Jesus sanctifies. And you need to come forward boldly and dwell, learn to dwell in his presence and enjoy him by faith in what he's accomplished. Not based on your feeling, but based on what you believe. And so Hebrews talks about coming into the full assurance of faith, which is the same thing as having your conscience perfected from evil, uh, an evil conscience. So we need to have our conscience perfected and then even be perfected to the point where we have no more consciousness of sin. Which means I am not always focused on my sin and overcoming sin. I'm focused on Christ. And as I do, he washes me. You say, how do I know he washed me? Because the word tells me that. If I come to him and in faith, I'm washed. Now we are legalistic, so we go, well, I don't feel washed. That's called mystical legalism. And we base everything on our feeling. I still feel defiled. Well, that's because you're in unbelief. But if you get over into faith and start preaching the gospel to yourself, you will experience a breakthrough from that spirit of condemnation, that spirit of death, that spirit of slavery and fear that's gripping you from the flesh. And some people won't do it. They think that feeling of condemnation is God's discipline and his speaking to them. And they think it's because they're not holy enough. And so instead of coming forward boldly and being washed and believing that they're washed, they say, I feel defiled, therefore I am defiled. God is displeased with me. He is disciplining me. And then they go back to trying to mind their P's and Q's and keep the law uh, to please God and get that feeling back. Okay, And that's really sad because the law is the strength of sin. And Paul said, you know, I was alive once until the law came, but then the law came, sin revived, and I died. And he said, the law that said, do not covet it, the sin in me, in my members, took advantage of that law and worked all manner of covetousness in me. So you may think, oh, well, I've overcome this one sin, you know, and uh, by my own strength. I've gritted my teeth and James toot it, and faith without works is dead, and I don't do that thing anymore, okay? But you haven't done that by coming forward to Christ and letting him be your life in that thing, you're doing it by your strength. And you're rejecting the teaching of justification and our sanctification by faith, sorry, and going back to the law and trying to become a law teacher for others. Well, I did it by my strength. Don't listen to these people who tell you you can just do anything. And no, we're not telling you you can do anything. We're telling you to come forward boldly to the throne of grace. Um, because you don't have power to overcome what's in you, in yourself. And here's the thing. Law is the strength of sin. And while they have overcome that one thing that they're so proud of, and then they're bringing other people into law, they don't realize that the law, the sin in their members, is working all manner of other evil. And so what I'm seeing is they double down and persecute. And the ones who think that they're so holy are going around saying the most evil things about people who teach sanctification by grace. It's like, how can your conscience allow you to say the kinds of things you're saying? I said, there's one brother who is, who just got caught telling, uh, trying to convince a friend of mine's son that she's not saved. Why? Because she teaches sanctification by faith. He's talking to her son and turn, trying to turn her son against him. Her, I'm sorry. He's going from wall to wall, and it's like, you can see him. He's going, see, I told you about this group. They're doing this and that and this and that, and, and saying all manner of evil things, mischaracterizing our teaching and our motives in his offense. And the root of it is that he rejected the teaching on sanctification by faith. And he may have, he thinks he's overcome this thing he's really thirsty for. But he's made himself miserable because he's, 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 quent, he's suppressing it in his flesh rather than drinking the living water. And I talked to him about this and warned him. He used to listen, you know. And uh, he knew that I was not just saying you can use grace as a license to sin uh, or go around and just do whatever you want. Our point is that as long as you've still got the desire, you're still a slave to it. 
And what the Lord wants to deal with is the root. And the way that root is dealt with is by Christ coming in and satisfying you with himself. And for some reason, at some point, this guy turned and rejected that teaching. And when he did, his heart became hard and he has been nothing but bitter since. And everything he does all over all the walls is just one personal attack against a, 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 of a discord, slander, ridicule, and speaking evil. And I've, I've watched it for months and I haven't said a thing. And I'm still not going to say who it is. But I watched somebody else do it. When you turn against the teaching that Christ is everything and try to go back to something else, you have to harden yourself to do it. And the law is the strength of sin. And so you may think that you're holy, but you are showing the whole world what's in your heart by the hatred you have for the brethren and what you're willing to say. You can't teach, you know, you say, well, what's wrong with teaching on holiness and obedience? Okay, well, let's hear you teach on it. The thing is, there is no teaching apart from Christ, right? If you reject Christ, you don't have holiness and obedience. What are you going to do? Teach law? So you, instead of doing that, they just turn into a gang of, uh, what do you call it? They just, a, a, a crowd with pitchforks is what I call it. They, and they go and they accumulate and they go from channel to channel trying to turn people against us, saying they're a cult, saying all these evil things. And the root of it is that they reject Christ as the means for sanctification. Doesn't mean they're not saved, but in doubling down and going back to law, the law is the strength of sin. And their hearts are hardened. It's sad to watch. It's really sad to watch. So yes, there is more to legalism than just believing that the law saves you. You can believe that you're saved by grace and still be a legalist. Because how are you sanctified and how do you live the Christian life? Is it by law or is it by Christ? And if I say it's by Christ, do you even know what I'm talking about? I'm crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live. Uh, but Christ in me and the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What does that mean to you? You think that means something or is that hidden from you because you are so law focused? Something to think about because ultimately... What people have a problem with is not me, but my teaching. But because they can't understand the teaching and they really have nothing to offer as an alternative, they resort to all this, you know, why well, I had a dream about him and he's evil and blah, 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 blah. He's going after this person and that person. No, I'm not. I'm teaching what I teach. I'm teaching what I've always taught on this channel and I've been faithful to stay with it. And yeah, people get offended because they're clinging to their own righteousness. That's the root of it. Um, all right, well, I'm going to have to listen to this back, but I just wanted to speak to this.